Welcome to a lecture on the Holy Sacrifice of the Eucharistic Celebration. This is based on the syllabus for Catechist's First Examination Handbook, published by the National Catechetical Center of Sri Lanka. And this is Lesson 4. And I am Trevor Ludovic making this presentation. And I will use a PowerPoint presentation as well during my lecture. So the Holy Sacrifice of the Eucharistic celebration will be, this lecture will be divided into two parts. And in part one, I'll be talking about the sacrifice in the Old Testament, then the sacrifice on Calvary, the Holy Eucharist and its connection with the sacrifice on Calvary, transubstantiation, and of course the Eucharistic miracles also. So, uh, to start with, the Eucharistic celebration is first and foremost the sacrifice of our Lord on Calvary, undoubtedly. Right? And the Eucharist, as you know, is the source and summit of Christian life. Why? Because Christian life starts at the foot of the cross, in a way. We become disciples of Jesus at the foot of the cross. And the sacrifice of our Lord on Calvary is what we celebrate during the Eucharist. When we come to the Eucharistic celebration, we are, as it were, standing at the foot of the cross in a timeless moment. And that is that consciousness we must have when we celebrate the Eucharist. We stand at the foot of the cross as we celebrate the Holy Eucharist. So, we talked about the Holy Eucharist as being the sacrifice of our Lord on Calvary. But first of all, what is sacrifice or why is sacrifice necessary? So sacrifice, as you know, is an offering to God in kind or, you know, in various ways. Material sacrifices, incense sacrifices, animal sacrifices. These were well known in the Old Testament, as you know. And even today, we have these sacrifices in various other religions. So pur the purpose of sacrifices are to offer to God are to adore and praise Him, to thank Him, to atone for our sins and also to ask for God's grace in our lives and our, for our sanctification. And throughout the Old Testament and the Bible we are told how our, our ancestors sacrificed animals, sacrificed their first fruits of their harvest in order to praise and thank God and also to atone for their sins and also to receive grace and sanctification. So, let's look at some of the incidents in the Old Testament where sacrifices were offered, sacrifices in the Old Testament. As you can see in this picture, we know people offered sacrifices to God. Here is Cain and Abel. I will read it from Genesis chapter 4 verse 2 to 3. Now Abel kept, kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. So in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. Right. So there is the first kind of uh, indication of an offering being made to God. Both are offering the fruits of their labor. Of course, we know the story that God was pleased with one sacrifice but not with the other and that caused the first murder in human history. Another offering after that we see uh, the next kind of prominent offering that we see in the Old Testament is that of Noah after the uh, floods. Right? Uh, Noah built an altar to the Lord after he and his family was rescued together with the uh, the animals in the ark. He took one of each kind of ritually clean animal and bird and burned them whole as a sacrifice on the altar. And the odor of the sacrifice pleased the Lord and he said to himself and so on. So it's Genesis chapter 8 verse 20 to 22 where we see sacrifice being offered on an altar by Noah. So in a way thanking God for protecting uh, them and him and his family as well as the animals from the floods whereas God 
destroyed the world because of its sin, but because Noah and his family were good, considered righteous before God, God saved them. And also, after the uh, flood was over and uh, they reached dry land, Noah offered you know, a sacrifice in thanksgiving to God. Then we have further on, we have this Melchizedek, the king of Salem. When Abraham came to meet him, he brought out bread and wine and he was a priest of the Most High and he blessed Abraham and he offered sacrifices to God in front of Abraham. Right? That's in Genesis chapter 14 verse 18. Then again, moving on in Genesis chapter 22 verse 1 to 3, we are told about how Abraham was asked by God. God himself asked Abraham to sacrifice his own son. Genesis chapter 22 verse 1 to 3. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So here God himself who promised a great nation to Abraham is testing Abraham and asking Abraham to sacrifice, to make a human sacrifice, a sacrifice of his only son. But I'm sure that wouldn't please God even though God wanted that to happen. And Lo and behold, God did not allow that to happen, but it was only a test of faith. And God himself sent a ram later on for the sacrifice. So anyway, Abraham was tested and by, offer, by, by being ready to offer his only son, his only son to God, Abraham was considered as being righteous, as being the father of faith. Then moving on, we come to the Exodus Another important event in the life of the people of Israel and our salvation history, Exodus chapter 29, verse 38 to 46, we are told, this is what you are to offer on the altar. This is God's instructions to the people, you know, during the Exodus. A two-year-old lamb each and every day, one lamb in the morning and the second lamb at evening. The sacrifice of the second lamb, the one at the evening, is also to be accompanied by the same grain offering and drink offering of the morning sacrifice to give a pleasing fragrance, a gift to God. See? So the Exodus event also, they offered the sacrifice of a lamb and various other sacrifices, grain of sacrifices, drink sacrifices. So sacrifices was very much part and parcel of man and God's relationship. The only way in which man was able to maintain his relationship with God and uh, sustain him his spiritual life is by offering sacrifices to God. Now we come to the most important part of the Holy Eucharist and that is the sacrifices of Jesus Christ. What is the connection between the sacrifice of the Old Testament and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on Calvary and the Holy Eucharist. So in the Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews chapter 10 verse 11 to 14, we are told the sacrifices and offerings of the Old Testament can be seen as prophetic of Christ's once and for all sacrifice on Calvary. So the Old Testament sacrifices of Abraham, of Noah, of Cain and Abel and uh, so on were kind of prophetic symbolisms of the one and for once and for all sacrifice of Christ. Now you see in the Old Testament we are told also in scriptures that all these sacrifices that the people offered in the Old Testament did not please God because God was not pleased with sacrifice. At one point a prophet tells, uh, tells the people you know God is sick of your offering. God says I am sick of these offerings and your, your temple worships because there is no justice among you. There is no love among you. So what is more important, I want sacrifice, I want, sorry, God says I want, I want compassion, I want, uh, you know, humanness, I want goodness than sacrifices. I don't want sacrifices, I this, this, uh, feel the sacrifices, I don't like, came to that point. 
where the sacrifice in the Old Testament was seen as not fulfilling what it was meant to do, to spiritualize the people, to make them holy. It wasn't making them holy. Right? Sacrifices divided the people sometimes. Uh, right. So, but the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus Christ is the only sacrifice that brought salvation to humankind. So the Holy Mass is the offering of the body, soul and divinity of Jesus Christ under the appearance of bread and wine. Right? And how is that happening? How did that happen? Jesus himself gave a command, if you remember, when he instituted the Last Supper, when he instituted the Holy Eucharist, he said, do this in memory of me. So the Eucharist is offered by the priest as a sacrifice to God the Father according to the rites of the New Testament as laid down by Christ himself and then handed down to us through the church through apostolic tradition and that is what we celebrate today in the Holy Eucharist. So Jesus Christ became the victim, the lamb that was slain and the perfect sacrifice and fully atoned for mankind's sin, the sins the, or the sacrifices in the Old Testament did not fully atone for the sins of mankind. There was something missing in those sacrifices, those animal sacrifices. And the perfect sacrifice was Jesus Christ himself, who is, he, he is the victim, he is the lamb that was slain. He is the priest who offers the sacrifice and he is the perfect sacrifice that we have, uh, that we celebrate in the Eucharist today. So Jesus Christ, as I told you earlier, took bread, said the blessing, thanked God, broke and gave it to his disciples. Chap Luke chapter 22 verse 19, the last supper when Jesus instituted the Holy Eucharist to perpetuate his sacrifice on Calvary. To perpetuate his sacrifice on Calvary. I think I will move my figure here so that you can see the script instead. And uh, should, yeah, Okay, let's move on. Right. So that's the Last Supper we are talking about. So Christ's singular and eternal sacrifice. Here I am trying to show you, you know, the Last Supper, the sacrifice on Calvary and the Mass. See this picture. Christ's sacrifice on Calvary was first anticipated at the Last Supper when Jesus took bread, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat, this is my body, that body that he was going to sacrifice on the cross. And he gave the cup and he said, this is my blood that is poured out for you. Do this in memory of me. And then he went up the next day on Good Friday. He sacrificed himself on the cross, died on the cross. But he left to us sacrament to perpetuate that event on Calvary. So the Calvary event and the Last Supper together is made present for us at the Holy Mass, the Holy Eucharist. So when we stand at the foot of the altar in whatever church we are, we must be conscious of the fact that we are actually standing at the foot of the cross like Mother Mary and John, the disciple. And we are told that Jesus told the disciple, Behold your mother and to the mother, behold your son. And there was the church. Jesus handed over the church to, to the Mother Mary. And uh, at that foot of the cross, we see, we stand today. In, we go back in time. The whole Eucharist, dear friends, transcend us, although we may be physically present in a particular uh, geographical location, whether you are in, in the St. Anthony's Church in Kochikade or at Madhu Church, uh, Our Lady of Madhu, or in Talavila or in, uh, you know, or in Rome or wherever you are, if you are at the Eucharistic celebration presided over by a priest, you are in fact at the foot of Mount Calvary. Let's remember that always. So the Holy Mass is a sacrifice. 
sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. It is a celebration of the Paschal mystery. What is the Paschal mystery? The passion, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the celebration of the Paschal mystery. So every time we sit at the uh, Holy Eucharist or participate in Holy Eucharist, we are celebrating the passion, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? which is the center of our faith. So then it is also a sacrificial meal. So we, we partake of a meal, we partake of the body and blood of Christ. So it is a sacrificial meal. It, it commemorates that uh, whole the Last Supper that was prefiguring the, in fact, the uh, sacrifice on Calvary. And the Holy Eucharist is also our thanksgiving, our praise to God for giving us this wonderful sacrifice on Calvary, the sacrifice of God's only son. Abraham was asked to offer his only son, but it in fact, finally, it was God who offered his only son, not Abraham. God offered his only son as the perfect sacrifice. And so the Holy Mass is also a praise and thanksgiving to God for that wonderful sacrifice that God made. God so loved the world that he sent his only son so that the world may be saved. And that's what happens at every Mass, dear friends. So the priest who celebrates the Mass is an instrument and shares in the priesthood of Christ. Of course, he, he, he represents Christ there at the Holy Eucharist. He represents Christ. So he's an instrument. He's a he. He's God. Jesus uses him as a as a, a manifestation of himself. But who celebrates the Eucharist, dear friends? Don't doubt at all. Every Eucharistic celebration, it is Jesus Himself who offers the mass. It is Jesus Himself who offers the mass because Jesus is now beyond time and space. He can be present at anywhere. He said, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I am present. And in giving the command to do this in memory of me, he himself is doing it in memory of his own sacrifice on Calvary. So in every Eucharistic celebration, we must remember that we are standing at the foot of the cross where Jesus himself is celebrating the Mass for us. He is truly present. He is truly present. So that brings us to the presence of Christ. He is truly present, yes. And the word that we used for, that is used for explaining or, you know, um, the, the mystery that happens, that miracle that happens during the Holy Mass is called transubstantiation. Big word, transubstantiation. Now it means the change of the whole substance of bread into the substance of the body of Christ while the external material objects remain the same, the substance has changed. Transubstantiation means the transformation of the substance while the accidents which are the bread and the wine remains as they are. So, but, on, but of course we know that in our faith we believe that in fact what we look at once the consecration is over is not just a piece of bread, not a bit of host, but Jesus Christ himself, his own flesh and the wine, his own blood. So this change is brought about in the Eucharistic prayer through the efficacy of the word of Christ and by the action of the Holy Spirit. So that is why during the, whole, during the consecration, the priest extends his hands over the bread and wine and he calls upon the Holy Spirit, asks God to send the Holy Spirit so that they may become the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And at that point, the transubstantiation takes place. Right? As soon as you, as the priest prays the prayer of which is known as the, the epiclesis, calling upon the Holy Spirit, the epiclesis, calling upon the Holy Spirit to transform these bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ, at that moment, Christ becomes sacramentally, truly and really present in the species of bread and wine. 
However, the outward characteristics of bread and wine, as I told you, that is the Eucharistic species, remain unaltered. Right? And we have this, what I have read to you, is from the compendium uh, of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Uh, you can check uh, CCC 1376 to 1377 and 1413 of the CCC, which is known as the Catechism of the Catholic Church. So transubstantiation is the miracle that takes place in the Holy Eucharist. So, but in the history of the church, we have people who doubted that this transubstantiation really takes place. There are Christian denominations that don't believe in the real presence of Christ in the Holy Eucharist. But we Catholics believe and therefore we also have so, so wonderful gifts of Eucharistic miracles with scientific proof that in fact the host after consecration is no longer a piece of wafer but the flesh. In fact, we, we, are, we are told that scientifically proven that they are able to prove that it is in fact part of a, of a, of a heart. Uh, and matching with the the, uh, the blood uh, group of Jesus Christ, uh, and that it was that in that the heart is it, it's a symbol of a person who was uh, experiencing immense suffering, physical suffering, mental agony when that person died. So all that is scientifically proven, and uh, these Eucharistic miracles are indeed wonderful. So. I just refer to uh, two miracles here uh, in France in uh, 1331, way back in 1331, March 31. The Eucharist falls out of a woman's mouth on an, onto an altar rail cloth. You know, we had altar rail cloths those days, the white cloth that is that is draped over the altar rail. And the priest tries to recover the host, but all that remains is a large spot of blood. On the same of the same size and dimensions as the wafer. The wafer had disappeared and that was left by it was only a, a blood spot of real human blood. So that was one miracle where it was proved that this was in fact the flesh of Jesus Christ. And then you know Italy we have again a priest has difficulties believing in the real presence Although he celebrated the Mass, he had doubts that actually the, the, the bread and wine turns into the body and blood of Christ. During the Mass, as he uh, utter the words of consecration and raises the host, we are told that blood begins to seep out of the host upon the consecration and falls onto the altar, onto the, onto the uh, corporal and onto the uh, altar cloth. And because of this miracle, Pope Urban the sixth commission the feast of Corpus Christi which is still celebrated today. So the origin of Corpus Christi was that particular uh, Eucharistic miracle that happened in Italy. We know various other miracles, hundreds of miracles have taken place over the years to prove that the body and blood in fact is the body and blood of Christ. Transubstantiation is true, real and we believe as Catholics in the real presence of Christ. That brings us to the end of the first part of the uh, of the lecture and I will meet you again in the second part.